Uh, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Richard Dennis. I'm the director of the Australia Institute and it's, uh, it's my honour and privilege to, uh, to welcome you here tonight. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging that we meet on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and we pay respects to their elders past and present. Um, I'd like to acknowledge in particular the, uh, the friends, family and, uh, and, and those uh, who had a personal relationship with Gavin Mooney in, in whose honour uh, tonight's oration is being held, the inaugural Gavin Mooney oration. Um, uh, Gavin and Dell, uh, as you may know, uh, died tragically last year and uh, we wanted to, uh, to honour uh, their contribution, their interests and their passions and, and that's why the, the topic of the oration is, is, about, uh, is concerned with, with the equity uh, issue which, uh, which Tim Costello and Ross Gittins will soon address. Professor Gavin Mooney was an internationally renowned health economist. Uh, some call him the father of Australian health economics. Uh, and, and as I said, he and his partner, uh, Dr. Dell Watson, died last year. And uh, again, to those who, who knew him, thank you so much uh, for coming to help us, uh, to help us honour his contribution. Uh, my interest in my, my, my uh, my uh, enthusiasm for organising tonight's event uh, stems from a conversation uh, that, uh, that started about 12 months ago between myself, Gavin, Alex Wodak, who's here, and David Morowitz, uh, who's also here. Uh, we started a conversation about uh, the importance uh, of inequality, the importance of addressing inequality, uh, and the broad relationship between inequality uh, and so many of the problems that, uh, uh, that we thought faced the country. And we started down the path towards uh, a research project aimed at identifying uh, the, the extent and implications of inequality, and, and sadly we never got to, to complete that topic. But, uh, while, we didn't, uh, while we didn't do that research project, I'm, I'm very proud that we've started a much broader conversation uh, with, uh, with tonight's oration. So, uh, so thank you uh, for coming along tonight. Uh, the structure of tonight uh, I'll hand over in a minute uh, to Professor Margaret Scheel, who is the Acting Vice-Chancellor of the University of Melbourne. Uh, she'll introduce our two speakers, uh, Tim Costello and Ross Gittins. And uh, after those presentations, there'll be a little bit of time for questions. So uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Margaret Scheel. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. And um, I would also like to extend my condolences to Gavin and Dell's family and friends here t tonight and uh, extend to all of you a very warm welcome on behalf of the University of Melbourne and also extend um, the apology of the Vice-Chancellor who's in, Bris in Brisbane, Glyn Davis, um, and also pass on uh, you know, a similar message from him. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the work of Richard and the Australia Institute in bringing about this evening's oration. As you're aware, uh, the Institute is a public policy think tank founded in the pursuit of equity and tonight's oration reflects the overlap between the interests of the Institute and Gavin's strongly held views um, that health economics could and should be used to achieve social justice. And um, I'd encourage you to um, visit their website and learn some more about uh, the very valuable work that they do. I never had the opportunity to meet Gavin in person, but um, in, the, in these strange twists of fate, I did actually uh, engage in a spirited exchange with him on Radio National where I was in the ABC studios in, in, in Parliament House in Canberra and he was in the, the ABC studios in Perth, and uh, which is kind of a surreal experience for those of you that have done that. You, you're debating someone you can't see. Um, and uh, the debate centred around uh, the use of lists of journals and ranked journal lists as part of the Excellence in, Australia, uh, excellence in Research for Australia initiative of which I was then responsible. And um, I was reflecting on this yesterday and uh, his remarks at the time and, and, and my spirited defence of uh, the then government policy. And 
he was concerned at the time about the impact of the lists on two things, on, on early career researchers and on interdisciplinary research. And, and you know, as I've learnt more about him um, in the lead up to this, I can see um, why he would have had those concerns and, and brought them to the fore. So uh, for those of you that followed this debate, the academics amongst you, um, we did, it wasn't very long after that, that that we recommended to the Minister that we should discontinue the use of the journal rankings as part of the next exercise for a, a whole range of reasons, but they included the impact of early career, on early career researchers and interdisciplinary research, so I'm sure he smiled from wherever he was at the time at that decision. So I think uh, to then lead on to our first speaker, no one is, is clearly better credentialed to deliver the first part of tonight's Gavin Mooney Memorial Oration than Tim Costello. Tim became a, a noted voice in the Victorian community during the early, uh, during nearly two decades as a Baptist church minister, first in St Kilda and later in, at Collins Street Baptist Church and uh, during a term as mayor of St Kilda. He has always been outspoken on social justice and equity issues, at one time clashing so frequently with the then Premier Jeff Kennett that Apparently, he labelled you as unVictorian, Tim. <laughs> I don't know whether you remember that, but uh, our research uh, uh, reports that. While a minister in Collins Street, Tim also served as executive director of an innovative outreach service to the homeless and disadvantaged, Urban Seed. In 2004, he became the CEO of World Vision Australia, and in the same year was also named Victorian a year of the Year, which was pretty good for someone who was unVictorian. Um, <laughs> I had the, the pleasure of sharing a podium with Tim last year when we launched the university's free trade initiative. It was one of almost the first um, functions that I undertook when I arrived at the university and I had the pleasure of um, being surrounded um, by a celebrity as all the students um, that were there that day were very keen to have their uh, photograph taken with Tim and, and interact with him. So it's a great pleasure to welcome him to give the first part of this oration. Thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction. It's uh, pretty much as I wrote it, really. Uh, <laughs> lovely to uh, see so many of you out on uh, such a cold and wet night, and I think it speaks volumes for uh, to honour uh, Gavin and Dell. Uh, I also did not know them, but uh, in being here to give uh, me sharing the platform uh, and the first oration, we know their legacy, uh, their footprint uh, is still. Uh, with us, and I think that's extraordinary. From what I've read of Gavin's work, his approach uh, demonstrated a particular genius, uh, which is really an excellent model. It's the genius of being an activist administrator, one who can work simultaneously from inside and from outside, from the inside out and from the outside in. And when you think how Australia has benefited enormously from people who've combined a purposeful vision of a better future with the ability to work within systems, applying specialists' technical expertise to achieve positive social change, it is an extraordinary gift. And uh, people like Nugget Coombs are others that come to mind in this tradition that I think he stands. So I think people like Gavin have played a long game. They've realised that real change doesn't usually come in a revolutionary burst, but in long evolutionary cycles. And the societies can go backwards as well as forwards, and gains that are achieved should never be taken for granted. Life is always a contest, and you have to both realise what the nature of that contest is and participate in it. His central idea about how health systems should function, equal access to equal care for equal need, is striking not only in its simplicity but in its usefulness. It's a touchstone for how the disciplines of policy and practice might be applied in a range of fields. Importantly, he saw that utility really that just means what works, and fairness are both closely linked with various forms of equality. And when you think about his contribution and you watch uh, 
the debates in America. Uh, I watched a little bit of Fox owned by that. Uh, I think he was described today by Jonathan Holmes as a grumpy American billionaire uh, who it seems has decided the outle- outcome of our election. We can save the money, really. You can give the money to World Vision because that, uh, <laughs> that American has actually decided where, where it's going to happen and how it's going to happen. Not where it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. But on Fox, I remember when Obama brought in what were pretty tame reforms by Australian standards in healthcare, just saying there's a health pie and 50 million people don't even get a slice and we're going to try and give them a slice. Fox uh, had commentators like Glenn Beck saying this decision is worse than the attack on Pearl Harbor. (laughs) It is worse than Soviet totalitarianism. And this sort of language and rhetoric uh, just ran out the whole time. Well, I think the very simple formula, equal access, to equal care for equal need in health systems is just so clear and striking and resonant and we owe a lot to Gavin for that. Well, when we think about what's fair and what's equitable, we know that fairness is a debatable concept. It's not simply a matter of distributive equality. It's not simply a notion of legal equality of rights. Equality and any particular economic or social metric do not automatically guarantee fairness. And yet there is an inextricable link between the two. And as I reflect on the challenges facing Australian society and societies around the world, I am struck by how frequently and powerfully the issue of equality strikes at the heart of fairness. Of course, my job with World Vision, working in over 100 countries, is visiting developing countries where inequality is not a matter of dry statistics. It's a radically different set of life chances. We all know that the case of your life chances, a person's prospect in life, really have to do with just two fundamental matters that are determined at birth. Who our parents are and the country in which we're born. Those two questions determine destiny and life chances. And they're pretty arbitrary. None of us choose the stage of life on which we're thrown up on. None of us choose our parents, but the DNA they give us and the health outcomes coded in are actually our lot. Well, even in those countries where economic growth is strong and average incomes are rising, Inequality remains a massive block to reducing (coughs) poverty. Uh, You might have seen The Economist a few weeks ago in its front cover, uh, a special report on the end of poverty. Now, The Economist isn't a particularly left-wing journal, but it estimated that a 1% increase in incomes in the most unequal countries produces a mere 0.6% reduction in poverty. Whereas a 1% increase in income in the most equal countries yields a 4.3% cut in poverty. This is why I'm leading the C20, for in Australia has the presidency of the G20, inequality is actually the cross-cutting theme across the 20 nations of civil society. And we have an economic argument. That is, as The Economist shows, The greater the inequality, the greater the barrier to productivity. Productivity which is of such an economic concern here. Greater equality, greater productivity, which is an argument we'll be making at the G20. So there is a core relationship between equality and fairness. It's certainly the case that the notions of justice are more complex than it just being about equality and fairness. Uh, Amartya Sen has a lovely picture in his book, the, uh, the Idea of Justice, where he talks about three children fighting over a flute. And uh, the first child says, I should have the flute because I'm the poorest child. This would be the only toy I would possess. The other two agree. He's very poor. He has no other toys. It's a pretty strong argument, that equality, egalitarian argument. The second child says, 
I should have the flute because I'm the only one that can play the flute. The other two agree, they can't play the flute. Here is a strong utilitarian argument. And uh, it will give maximum pleasure to that child and maximum pleasure to people who can hear the child who can play the flute. The third child comes in with a very strong rights, liberal rights argument. This child says, I should own the flute and have the flute because I made the flute. When I finished making it, these two turned up and they claimed it. What I made should be mine. Well, you start to unpack that there are strands of fairness in the utilitarian, in the egalitarian, in the libertarian, liberal view of property rights. So that when we talk about equality and fairness, we do have to acknowledge which strand we privilege and why. And it's always more complex than just an obvious, immediate appeal. But equality and fairness is intrinsically connected because I think we all agree in moral equality. It's sometimes referred to as human dignity. The idea that whatever the circumstances, there is an inherent worth in every human person. And that worth is the same worth. We struggle to actually weight this. We say universal human rights are indivisible, but we really struggle to actually live that out. In Christian faith, we say all of us are made in the image of God. The story of the Good Samaritan is profound in the sense that he is stripped naked, which means the priest and the Levite, when they pass him by, pass by him, see his wounds, can't tell if he's one of their mob. Is he Jewish? And they have a direct ethical duty. He's naked. They can't tell his religion, his ethnicity. There's no outward way of telling. Same problem for the Samaritan. Uh, he can't tell if he's a Samaritan, and therefore a clear ethical duty. He's one of my mob, like we feel about at least Australian citizens and our duties to them. And yet in the story, the Samaritan actually overcomes that primary nationalistic religious claim, binds up his wounds and pays the money and, and cares for him. Jesus is making the point, universal rights, if you like, in our modern language, are universal. Even when you can't tell if there is an ethical claim on you, there is, who whatever that person is. I uh, was meeting with uh, maybe the next foreign minister for uh, Britain, Douglas Alexander. He's the opposition foreign minister in uh, the British Parliament, and uh, we were talking about this because he's a Scot. He was actually in Glasgow when Margaret Thatcher, as Prime Minister, delivered a political homily on the Good Samaritan. She said, the point of the Good Samaritan is, the Good Samaritan had money in his pocket, and that's why he was able to help. <laughs> Self-reliance, economic independence are the fundamental attributes. Otherwise, he couldn't have paid the innkeeper's bill and said, I'll pay whatever it takes until he's healed. That's the point. No, I actually think the point is a bit deeper. That may be a point, Margaret Thatcher. The point is that equality and fairness are embedded in a moral equality of intrinsic human worth. Whatever, whatever the mob, the religion, the colour, the socioeconomic uh, class. So in saying that, it is saying such worth is not earned. It has nothing to do with measuring a person's relative moral value or their economic status. It is a very simple foundation, inherent, beyond measure, because it is inherent. So technically, it's simple to devise ways of measuring wealth or productivity or potential productivity but we must never confuse wealth and worth. It's a concept that sits very un unhappily with uh, economists and management consultants, but an idea that has deep roots across cultures, religions and traditions that finds support in secular idealism and certainly universal human rights. 
It has been the foundation for modern conceptions of human rights, including the view that rights are incomplete unless people have the means to exercise them. And in a moral sense, that's where inequality strikes hard. The denial of people's actual means to exercise their rights, to make meaningful choices about the questions that affect their own lives and the lives of their community in which they live, is a denial of their worth. Now, we know that the struggles over economic equality through history really are the engine of the great political debates, of political difference that is represented still today. And I think that will remain the case in, into the future. So I don't expect a grand consensus anytime soon. But acknowledging that these political debates uh, will go on, I think we can still think beyond ideologies, simple left-right dichotomies, and discover elements even in our different political traditions that make for both equity and utility. Respect for individuals, choice and freedom to genuinely exercise choice are ideas that should appeal to those who call themselves liberals. Liberals in a political sense, conservatives. Systems and processes that support social cohesion, mutual responsibility, stability and sustainability should naturally appeal to those who are conservatives. And the central notion of human dignity, equal rights and equal claim on the necessities to support a decent life should appeal to those who consider themselves progressive. How the accent falls in policies divides left and right, but let's actually always remind ourselves of the consensus and articulate that and build that bridge. We certainly need to be on guard against creeping injustice to acknowledge and address inequalities that exist in our community today and to be under no illusions as to the difficulty of the task. In the parliamentary term that has just ended, I think we've made significant achievements in moving towards a more equitable Australia. Disability care, really the classic example of moral worth. Reforms in education funding, improvements in paid parental leave, whether it's a Liberal or a Labor policy uh, standouts. Yet in every case, let's acknowledge it's been a struggle to get there. There is always difficulty in approaching and achieving a political consensus. It comes only after often long periods of negative, adversarial, politicking and brand distinction not just between government and opposition, but between Commonwealth and states, and of course a, a set of multiple interest groups always advancing their own interests. It is always a contest. Politics ultimately is about how we live together, how we share the burdens when sacrifices have to be made, how we share the prosperity when it, the benefits can be shared out. And that contest inevitably means someone wins and someone loses. Politics is always a contest. But acknowledging that context of multiple interests, we need to also try and acknowledge the political consensus that equality and inherent worth is about. This is how we do it in democracies and uh, the practicalities and the economics of reform have to be debated and examined closely. It certainly strikes me, having said that this is a given, that it does seem harder to get traction for po positive social change in Australia than perhaps in decades past. I ask myself, why? What's changed? What can we learn? Part of it may be just the degree of pessimism, which in some ways is part of the mood cycle that nations and communities go through. Many of us point to the 24-hour news cycle and just being completely over, being bombarded with information and disengaging. It may be the sense of globalisation, that national governments don't have levers when they make promises at elections that they can pull, that retail sales in uh, Melbourne here are much more affected by what's happening in China than anything actually happening here. 
But I think, uh, and we can talk about the adversarial political system, but I think one of the big things that has changed that makes it harder to get traction for po positive social change is the deep scepticism that has grown up around institutions and around leadership in general. And I think we do need to talk about that. It's not a phenomenon restricted to Australia. I think probably in Australia we only have a mild dose of this ailment. If you look at the paralysis in Congress in the US and the impossibility of actually moving there, it's much worse. The disenchantment is not just uh, about our body politic and political institutions and leadership. It's disenchantment with business, with media, with religious institutions, and of course, sporting codes. And I confess I'm an Essendon Barracka. The degree of doubt and suspicion about institutions that are the glue through which we live out our lives, it has been weakened and it's evaporating. It may not be totally scientific, but the Essential Poll has asked Australians about their level of trust in various institutions four times over the last two years. The results suggest a lot of people are very jaded and sceptical. Who do they trust? Well, the High Court, the ABC and the Reserve Bank still enjoy strong majority trust, according to Essential. Charitable organisations such as the one I lead just fall over the line with 52% support. Environment groups and the Commonwealth Public Service only manage to reach the 30% level. But from then on, it's all negative. Business, trade unions, religious organisations, newspaper, TV, online media, political parties, federal and state parliaments, local councils, these are in really low, low territory of trust. They remain functional, they're still doing what they're meant to do, but people aren't respecting them as they once did. Well, it points to a problem of feeling disconnected, disenfranchised from social institutions, which actually are profoundly important for the quality of our democracy. The way we respond and live out our lives in a democracy is through these institutions. We find it very hard to do individually except once every three years at a, at a ballot box. Our capacity to drive social change is not, as sometimes as, uh, assumed, grounded in discontent and alienation. It depends on civic engagement, purposeful optimism, and then channels that institutions represent to actually organise and express why we are advocating for social change. As I said, Australia's not the worst. I was quite struck in the Italian election earlier this year. 25% of the nation's voters voted for a party literally led by a clown, a comedian. He offered no policies. He refused to be part of any government. He was running as an anti-politician, channeling people's disenchantment and delusion, and he got 25% of the national vote. Well, emotionally very satisfying, but equally very dangerous, creating even further distance between people and decisions, a political vacuum, and we know other forces better organised can fill that. Well, in Australia, we're not anywhere near that. But we shouldn't wait until we are near that dangerous abyss. So in summary, I think an equitable Australia is possible and desirable. We still have tools in the toolbox we can use to move the country in the right direction. We must keep hope alive, not become cynical and disengaged. I passionately believe we need to address economic inequality because there's very clear evidence that unequal societies do much less well in every sense than more equal ones. But I also think we need to think about social equity, grounded in human dignity and moral equality. I'm quite struck by the work of a Canadian uh, whose work on ageing has been extraordinary, Carey Keyes. His story is interesting. He was raised by his grandparents. And he noticed, because they're wonderful people growing up, that his 
grandfather hardly aged and his grandmother aged really fast. And when he went to do his PhD, his whole work in health and ageing was actually organised around why was it like this? That his grandfather stayed young and involved and his grandmother aged so quickly. His work has revolutionised aged care and what he did through lots of testing was develop essentially 14 questions and a 14 point framework, trial and error. They're pretty banal questions, you know. How many times a day do you laugh? Do you feel valued in your job? 14 questions. Anyway, his work was profoundly saying it isn't just economics that determines a whole lot of outcomes around ageing and health. It has to do with some other social factors, some psychological, others communal and relational. So when we think about social equity, we need to be thinking laterally, not just only in terms of economics. Thinking about that because human dignity and moral equality demand we ask those sort of, sorts of questions. Certainly we need perspective on how the country's travelling, economically and other ways. The challenges are substantial. But the sky isn't falling in. We must not be mired in pessimism. You could be forgiven for listening to some of the debate and think Australians think we're in Greece or Spain. That all is terrible. That's absolutely not the case. But we need to recognise that sustaining progress towards a fairer Australia is only possible if we attend to the quality and trustworthiness of our institutions, participating in them, engaging in them, and supporting quality leadership in them. Economic prior prosperity is like a functioning, healthy human body. It comes at a price if there's radical inequality or a situation where some people and groups are excluded and marginalised, which we know creates social dysfunction and distress. But we can have a situation of a society that looks healthy on the outside, but is lacking in mental and spiritual health, where the benefits of flourishing and prosperity go missing. Keep the camera lens panning wide to look beyond economics. That sort of vision, I think Gavin Mooney has taught us would have been satisfied with and as people standing in his shoes, we can recommit ourselves to that vision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, for those really um, clear and visionary remarks, if should I um, pardon the pun. Uh, I believe Richard's going to probably mediate some questions towards the end, so um, we'll move on now to our next speaker, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome and introduce Ross Gittens. Um, no one could be more suitable to pick up uh, where Tim left off. Ross is economics editor for the Sydney Morning Herald and economic columnist for The Age. He's, through a range of um, media and commentary and argument, acquired a unique a public rep reputation as an authority on uh, economic matters, and I think uh, mostly in part because we can often understand you, Ross, which is a great thing. Um, and uh, he's used that uh, rare gift of explaining difficult uh, economic con concepts, both in his uh, regular <coughs> press articles, but also in a range of books, including Gitonomics, Living the Good Life Without Money Stress, Overwork and Joyless Consumption. I think I'd really like to recommend that to my daughter. Um, <laughs> Gittin's Guide to Economics and Gittin's Gospel. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here to the university and uh, to, for you to deliver the second part of this oration. Thank you. Well, thank you. I uh, have to confess, I too didn't know Gavin Mooney. But I do know that, unusually for an economist, he had a deep concern for fairness, or as economists call it, equity. Uh, so it's highly appropriate that, th that in this inaugural Gavin Mooney Memorial Oration, we address the case for a more equitable Australia. I want to talk about the economic case 
for, more, for a more equitable Australia. But before I do, I want to enter a major caveat. Why should we seek a more equitable Australia in which income and wealth and opportunity are shared more fairly between the top and the bottom? For no better reason than that it's the ethical, moral, right thing to do. If it's the moral thing to do, the thing that for Christians Jesus wants us to do and most other religions and humanist ethical codes tell us we should do, we don't need any supporting arguments. I've often heard the ethicist Simon Longstaff say that if you're ethical in your business practices because you believe it's good for business, you're not being ethical at all. Ethics as a profit-making strategy isn't ethics. One of the things I've learnt from my reading of psychology is that it's always better to do things for intrinsic rather than extrinsic motives. It's better to do things for their own sake because you enjoy doing them or you believe it's your duty to do them than because doing them brings you some sort of external reward, money, power, fame, status. I'm often sorry when I hear people in noble occupations defending what they do with instrumental arguments. I'd like to hear more vice-chancellors say they believe in increasing and spreading knowledge for its own sake. That a rich country like ours can afford to spend a fair bit of its wealth on satisfying our insatiable human curiosity. And that the better educated people are, the more they can get out of life, even if they never put that education to use in the workforce. Rather than arguing that investing in education is good for the economy. I'm sorry when I hear people in the arts arguing that the arts create many jobs. When we do this, we're giving in to the hyper-materialism of our age. But having said that, I have to acknowledge that Tim is more qualified than me to make the moral case for a more equitable Australia. And he's just done that. And as an economic journalist, it's more appropriate for me to make the economic case. So it may seem that I'm about to do what I just said other people shouldn't do, argue that we should be more equitable because this would make the community better off materially. I actually believe that to be true. Just as it's true that spending more on education would make us all better off materially, but I act, I'm actually going to make the mirror image argument that making Australia more equitable wouldn't make us worse off. Why am I mounting such a negative argument? Because there's a widespread belief among economists and their fellow travellers that making Australia more equitable would leave the community worse off materially. That it would come at the cost of a lower material standard of living overall if income or wealth or opportunity were shared more equally or less unequally. The long-standing conventional wisdom among mainstream economists is that equity is in conflict with efficiency. That is, the efficient allocation of resources so as to maximise the community's material standard of living and to foster economic growth. Economists are comfortable with objectives being in conflict because a key part of their expertise is knowing how such conflicts are resolved. By trading off one unit of equity 
for one unit of efficiency or vice versa and continuing to do this until you've achieved the particular combination of equity and efficiency that gives you maximum satisfaction overall. It's the concept of the trade-off. It's central to conventional economics. Once you've achieved that ideal trade-off, you've achieved economic nirvana <laughs> equilibrium. <laughs> In practice, however, it's actually worse than that. Economists specialise in efficiency, but not equity. That's what made Gavin such an unusual economist. Their contribution to society is to explain to the community how to organise the economy in ways that maximise our utility or satisfaction from the production and consumption of goods and services and how to keep our material standard of living improving every year. That's the contribution that economists make to society. If you believe that efficiency and equity are always in conflict, so anything you do to improve equity will always be at the expense of efficiency, but you, as an economist, happen to specialise in efficiency, it's easy to decide to focus on efficiency and ignore equity. After all, we live in an age of ever-increasing specialisation, which is actually a primary source of productivity improvement and thus our ever-rising material affluence. So you focus on efficiency and growth and you leave equity for others to worry about. You bolster this decision by observing that whereas efficiency is equitable, is, sorry, is objective and measurable, equity is highly subjective. Fairness is in the eye of the beholder. So you tell yourself, and anyone who asks, that you stick to the science and leave the value judgments to those more qualified such as the politicians. The problem is, if it's not true that efficiency and equity are in conflict, or not always true, then the economists will be failing to advise politicians of cases where equity can be improved without any loss of efficiency. That is, failing to advise the community that there's a free lunch on offer and if, because of their lack of interest in equity as an objective, economists fail to draw attention to those cases where improving equity can also lead to improved efficiency, then economists are failing in their own spe specified role to maximise efficiency and failing to point out cases where we can kill two birds with one stone. I'm sure there are plenty of cases where equity and efficiency really are in conflict. I'm sure there are plenty of cases where equity and efficiency are in conflict. But I'm equally sure there are many cases, far more than we realise, where they aren't that there are delicious free lunches going begging and opportunities to increase efficiency that the efficiency experts themselves haven't noticed because of this kink in their thinking. Let's start by looking at the limited case. Where is the evidence that greater equity damages efficiency? The opponents of government intervention have been searching for years for cross-country or other evidence that developed economies with a bigger public sector, and thus you'd expect a more redistributive tax and transfer system, have inferior records on economic growth. They haven't found it. Nor have they found evidence that countries with a less unequal distribution of income between households have inferior economic growth. 
In his book, The Price of Inequality, the Nobel Prize winning economist Joe Stiglitz observes that various European countries enjoy a standard of living much the same as America's while doing much more to reduce inequality than America does, income inequality. So there's little evidence we have to accept a highly unequal society to preserve an efficient growing economy. Studies show the US has surprisingly low social mobility. Few people with poor parents go on to have high incomes. And conversely, few people suffer a decline in income between generations. If you can stay rich in America without trying and stay poor despite trying, it's hard to believe this won't lead to a long-term decline in the dynamism of the US economy. So let's move on to the evidence for the more positive case that equity and efficiency can pull together, that reduced inequality can actually enhance efficiency and growth. There's a growing amount of such evidence but before we get on to it, I need to acknowledge the contribution of Gavin Mooney. One of his great research interests was in what health economists and public health medicos call the social gradient or the social determinants of health. There's much evidence that the health of people with low socioeconomic status is much worse than that of people with high socioeconomic status. <coughs> the obvious response to this evidence is to say that measures to improve the health of people on the bottom ought to lead to a very real improvement in their well-being. That's the equity objective. But health, like education, is one of those things that are both a means and an end in themselves an instrument as well as an objective. The better educated a population is, the more its labour is worth and the richer we can expect it to be. Similarly, the healthier a population is, the more able it is to work and the richer we can expect it to be. So the more we do to improve the health of the bottom half, the more efficient the economy should be and the faster it should grow. Stiglitz cites an IMS study finding that the less unequal a country's income distribution is, the further apart its recessions are likely to be. That is, the less macroeconomic instability it's likely to suffer. His book contains much similar evidence and arguments, but I want to refer to the work of one other American Nobel laureate, James Heckman, before I move my argument closer to home. Heckman's work demonstrates the almost magical power that at attending to the early childhood development of at-risk children has in reducing the likelihood of them getting into trouble with the police, dropping out of school, being in and out of employment and in and out of jail. It's obvious that the success of such a program would do much to improve equality of opportunity. And it's not hard to see <clears throat> that it would also greatly improve the beneficiary's contribution to the paid labour force, not to mention the pressure on government spending. The most obvious case of increasing equity, also increasing efficiency, is unemployment. We think it's unfair to have people who want to work unable to find a job, not just because it leaves them with less to spend, but also because we know the unemployed are particularly unhappy. Sure, 
but it's also glaringly inefficient to have people who are able to work lying around idle and not contributing to national production. Finding ways to get those people back to work would often make a far greater contribution to efficiency than many of the microeconomic reforms economists hanker after. They leave the, the, the efficiency gains to be had by reducing unemployment aside while they worry about all these other bits and pieces where surely if we had major and politically unpopular reform, we could get a bit more efficiency. Two prominent and now apparently bipartisan policies in this election campaign are seen as primarily about equity, but nonetheless should bring significant efficiency benefits. The first is the Gonski reforms to school funding, which are intended to increase the assistance able to be given to students suffering one form of disadvantage or another, regardless of which school system they're in. If this results in more young people gaining a better education, the value of their labour is increased as well as their degree of participation in the labour force. It's a similar situation with the National Disability Insurance Scheme. It can be expected to increase workforce participation and the acquisition of skills. And where unpaid carers with high skills are able to return to the workforce after being replaced by paid carers with lesser skills, there's obviously some increase in the skills of the workforce. According to the estimates of no lesser authority than the Productivity Commission, the disability scheme could be expected to lead to an annual increase in real gross domestic product reaching one, percent, one percentage point by 2050. So over the years between now and 2050, the gain would grow each year until it reached one, a full percentage point of GDP. Finally, in an issue that's dear to my heart, there's a, there is growing evidence that organising work in the workplace in ways designed to increase the satisfaction workers derive from their work by making sure you put round pegs in round holes or having them work in teams or giving them greater personal autonomy or a say in the way things are run. Doing that, making sure uh, you finding ways to increase the satisfaction that workers derive from their work leads them to make a better contribution to the success of the firm. I don't find that very hard to believe and there's growing evidence uh, in support of that. Since most of us are doomed to spend 40 hours a week working for most of our lives, it amazes me the populace hasn't long ago insisted that work be made as satisfying as possible. The growing evidence that doing this would also increase efficiency makes it even more amazing that we don't have more emphasis on saying, if I have to work, at least let me enjoy the work. The case for greater equity in Australia is fundamentally a moral one. We should do it because it's the right thing to do. But the economic efficiency case for not making Australia more equitable is weaker than many economists assume. There is evidence we can increase equity in ways that don't reduce efficiency. And if we look for them, there are many ways we can reduce inequality and increase efficiency at the same time. So let's do it.
Well, thank you very much, Ross and, and Tim. And uh, uh, I'm just going to make a few short comments before uh, uh, before we throw it open to questions. Um, uh, the Australia Institute's done a lot of work on inequality over the years, and uh, with my predecessor, Clive Hamilton, in fact, uh, we wrote a book called Affluenza, uh, When Too Much is Barely Enough. Uh, and, and in researching that book, we asked Australians a number of questions, one of which was, uh, can you afford to buy everything you really need? And uh, around 40% of people who earn more than $100,000 a year believe that they can't afford to buy everything they really need. Now, I know that doesn't apply to anyone in this room. All right, we're, we're talking about the other people. Um, but the, to understand inequality, uh, of course, we have to understand ourselves. To understand inequality, of course, we have to understand the society we live in. And uh, I guess our research has shown and, and my personal observation has shown that most people don't actually understand where they fit uh, in society. The, the, the information we get about other people is not very balanced. The, the stories that we see about other people are far more likely to be about people who have far more than us uh, than people who have far less than us. So con consider the following. Uh, is anyone in this room six foot four or taller? I'm clearly not. <laughs> Couple of people. Okay, if you are six foot four, then you are amongst the tallest 1% of people in Australia. This is what we call an empirical fact. We can measure people and we can plot a distribution and if you're six foot four or taller, you're in the tallest 1%. In other words, you are taller than 99% of people. But if you're six foot four and you meet someone who is seven foot tall, you don't become short. <laughs> you don't become average. You don't become median. You are still very, very tall. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing, because this, this seems to confuse Australians. Because we know in Australia that there are people, in fact, a member of parliament told us this, there are people in Australia who earn a quarter of a million dollars a year who are doing it tough. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> a quarter of a million dollars a year. And we're told that some of these people, $250,000 a year, $5,000 a week, feel that they're doing it tough. And the problem is they've heard of someone who has more. Gina Reinhart has $20 billion. Some executive gets paid $10 million. And ridiculous though it would seem for someone who's six foot four to feel short when they meet someone who's seven foot, in Australian public debate at least, it is not embarrassing to admit that earning a quarter of a million dollars a year, earning more than 99% of Australians, that you actually feel average or even like you're on Struggle Street. So equality and inequality are fundamental, and, and we've heard two fantastic talks about this tonight. But we can't understand inequality unless we understand ourselves. We can't understand inequality unless we understand the society we live in. And of course, I'd go much broader. We can't understand equality unless we understand that simply as Tim suggested, to be born in Australia today places you amongst the wealthiest people the world has ever known. I mean, someone who is employed in Australia is living in, in one of the richest countries in the world at the richest point in world history. And we hear about the cost of living and we hear about the pressures that families face and we know uh, that electricity is getting dearer. These things are all true. But unless someone places this into a context for us, then, then, then like the six foot four people who I'm sure don't really feel too short, and I'm sorry if you do, and I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry if I've made you feel bad about yourselves uh, by reminding you that some people are seven foot tall, unless we understand ourselves, we can't possibly imagine that. So, uh, so for me, inequality... Uh, is, is fundamental to, to addressing uh, social challenges, economic challenges, indeed environmental challenges. Because if people who earn a quarter of a million dollars 
fear that they lack enough stuff to make themselves happy. Well, frankly, the planet has virtually no capacity to deliver that amount of stuff to 8 billion people. So, um, uh, so thank you to Tim and thank you to Ross uh, for, in, in, in different ways, uh, bringing us to think about uh, both, uh, both the moral case, and I think I agree with Ross, uh, I'm an economist, and uh, I think the, the reason to pursue equality is it's the right thing to do. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's reassuring perhaps uh, for, for non-economists to hear that, you know, th there is no strong economic argument for pursuing inequality and in turn there is no large cost uh, for, uh, uh, for, uh, for addressing that inequality. So the next stage of tonight is, is to start a bit of a conversation. We've, we've got a bit of time. Uh, so can I please invite Tim and Ross to come back up? They've got some microphones strapped to them, um, uh, I hope. Um, and uh, in terms of conversation, uh, the, the Australia Institute, as I said, is very uh, keen to, uh, to, to continue the conversation that... Uh, that, that Gavin started with us a little while ago. We hope this is the first uh, Gavin Mooney oration. Um, th there'll be a clipboard floating around. If you, if you want to know about next year's event, which we do hope to organise, if you want to know more about the, uh, uh, the, 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 the equity agenda coming out of the Australia Institute, please, uh, please just give us your email address on that clipboard, which will be floating around somewhere. But uh, uh, can, we, uh, can we throw to questions now? Yep, right up the front. Would you care to oh, sorry, there, there will be microphones. That's my fault. Uh, just, uh, and if, if other people want questions, stick your hand up and I'll, uh, I'll try to get through as many as I can. Would you care to comment on the religious exemptions in our Equal Opportunity Acts which deny lesbians and gays their human rights according to the Universal Declaration and our propensity to look overseas to fix problems rather addressing the mess in our own backyard with the first Australians? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Do I well, you've got you've got a mic. I, I think you can just I've talk. Got a mic, yeah, I've, no, oh, I've got a mic. You've yes. got a mic. <laughs> You're live, Tim. Okay, uh, let me start with the second one first. Um, I'm always troubled when we set the poor against the poor, and I often hear. I'm not. No, you're not saying this, but I often hear people say charity begins at home, and the subtext is and it ends at home. Usually the people saying that the loudest are the ones I've discovered doing the least about it at home. Uh, the truth is we can do both. We need to deal with our Indigenous situation and we are wealthy enough um, to actually be generous to our neighbours in our overseas aid levels. When you think of uh, the monies that I think are, are wasted from the public purse to actually set up a bidding war between our Indigenous and people overseas, or single mums and people overseas, is a false choice. Uh, having said that, with Indigenous, we know the complex labyrinthal institutional arrangements um, mean that you have a set of complexities which isn't just about money. The fly-in, fly-out state and federal bureaucrats and uh, lack of relational uh, engagement doesn't surprise me that when Indigenous here are for, in the remote communities are four-wheel drive coming into their community, they decide to go hunting or fishing. They've been consulted to death. It's another set of relationships. Uh, so um, in one community, and uh, World Vision's working in Indigenous communities, 350 people, 52 different agencies working with 350 people. It's nonsense. And rotating relationships because people turn over in those agencies. This has something more to do with the lack of closing the gap, in my view, than a money issue. Um, when it comes to religious exemptions, we are always caught up in society with competing rights. Uh, I'm often being called a person who wants a nanny state because I want to slow down pokies and I ask why Australia has 21% of the world's pokies. 
we're 0.2% of the world's population, how did this get out of control? So I'm a nanny state person. But I often find myself saying, I don't actually mind a nanny state. If I know that there is a seat belt law so my children have to be strapped in, if I know there are some limits in alcohol when my young sons go out at night and they're not going to be served, I actually think that's good. They're not going to get bashed or do something stupid. But we then also... Um, maximise pr um, autonomy and freedom of expression over and against the nanny state. We want both. When it comes to religious exemptions, I see it as part of this debate. There is the sense that equal employment and no exemptions for anyone around that is a fundamental human right. Equally, there are religious uh, traditions that want to be true to their vision and whatever we think of that vision in ways that they have chosen to discriminate, they have a right to actually be true to that vision. Competing rights, we actually have to find some way to recognise both um, and that's what democracy is about, trying to fairly transparently recognise that there are those competing rights. Okay, yep, up over here. Don't be shy to put your hand up. I'm trying to spot the next one while they're answering, so. Uh, thank you. Oh, that's loud. The um, question has two parts. The first part, um, Reverend Costello, you mentioned the list of trusted institutions, I think of the High Court, the ABC, the Reserve Bank. They all seem to have an ideal behind them, the ABC, free public broadcasting, the ideal of justice, the Reserve Bank, I assume, has some ideal behind it as well. Um, uh, are we sort of, uh, since the, the end of history and the rise of evidence-based policy, have we given up on ideals? And then the second part of the question is um, more to do with what you were talking about, Ross, about, um, you know, I'm thinking there's a lot of economic studies that, that have just started to come out that show, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats, that in fact policies to help the rich help the rich, that's what they do, and that countries with greater social mobility have redistributive policies, why is it that we still hear that the way to increase economic growth and to make us all better is to, say, cut the company tax? <laughs> well, I think I agree with you that there is less uh, idealism these days than there was. My personal theory is that we're living through an era of hyper-materialism, that humans have always been materialist, that the material is actually very important. I don't believe that the work that economists do as people who specialise in the material is irrelevant to the interests of the community by any means. Um, but I believe, and I think there is evidence, that we are lot more materialistic than we used to be even just 30 years ago. And I think that uh, that's actually one of the reasons for the rise of economic rationalism. I think it's one of the reasons why politicians uh, take more notice of economists than they used to and are more inclined to take economists' advice than they were. And I think that that kind of increasing emphasis on economics and the opinions of economists, which are give, taken far more seriously than the opinions of lots of other people, including clerics, I think that that's actually a two-way thing. I think it's a product of our more materialist attitudes so that we are more interested in what the economists have got to say about how we can all make ourselves richer. But I also think that, that it works the other way that the more we hear from economists, the more they emphasise that we need to organise the community, the society, the economy in ways that maximise material growth. Uh, and, I, and I think that's a big part of the explanation of what you're talking about, but that is just my big hobby horse. Tim? Yeah, I... I absolutely agree with that. It seems to me that um, ideals once had a discourse around relationship and community and equality and belief and a range of those things. The, uh, 
uh, hyper-materialism is an expression of now the dominant story. We all live out dominant stories and indwell them without even questioning their plausibility. And the dominant story is, the wealthier I am, the happier I'll be. We know that it is true, the people World Vision works with, if you can't guarantee education and clean water and enough food, you feel a failure as a parent and you're not happy. But we know that in our hyper-materialist Western culture, the, uh, there is a threshold you cross in terms of wealth where actually greater wealth isn't leading to greater happiness. It's greater drivenness and stress and often being relational poor and family and time poor. And I think that story is so seductive, so plausible, we never stop to question it, but it has replaced other ideals of relationship and community and equality and belief. I don't think it's true of everyone. I'm quite encouraged by Gen Y. I gave up on Gen X, sorry if you're here, but Gen Y. <laughs> I should say as a baby boomer, you know, my generation's proved to be the worst saving, highest spending, most greedy generation in human history, so I'm condemning my generation too. Government had to introduce compulsory superannuation to make my generation safe. Um, but Gen Y actually have ideals. I'm seeing a whole lot of them having a go, believing they can make a difference. Maybe it's going to fade out, but uh, I, I don't think ideals are completely gone. Uh, uh, David Morowitz up the front here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just uh, ask a question relating to what you started with, Tim, when you were talking about the Fox News uh, in the United States and how they regarded providing uh, health to the poor uh, as a terrible thing, a communist type of plot. So uh, we read this week that Rupert Murdoch has sent his chief flamethrower, Cole Allen, otherwise known as Cole Pot, in the News Limited uh, organisation, to come and put a, put a flame under the News Limited press so that they go harder on Kevin Rudd. And apparently he had a meeting last Tuesday with all the editors saying... Yes, you've been going hard on him, but you have to go harder. And then on Saturday in The Australian, there were not one but four pieces on the front page which said, Rudd is ruining this, Rudd has ruined that, and so on. 70% um, of the newspapers in Australia are owned by this gentleman. Uh, many people in marginal seats only get to read those newspapers. What can be done to try and level the balance against somebody who is clearly running a line? Ross, do you want to have a go at this? <laughs> the Fairfax right of reply. I'm, uh, <laughs> you read that story in the, in the Fairfax uh, media. I'm not sure that I completely believe it. Um, I think it's kind of, it may, there may be an element of truth to it. Um, what can be done about it? I think it probably is true that uh, the, the Murdoch press does have an influence, but I also believe that the media doesn't have as much of an influence as most people outside the media believe it does. People see things from their own perspective and they see them through their own filter. When you talk about Fox News, for example, Fox News isn't about politics. Fox News is about a commercial strategy, about a business plan. It's about saying, I've got a great idea how we can make more money out of this product we sell called news. We will fashion it in a way that appeals to a particular segment, segment of the community, to a particular part of the uh, political spectrum, and we'll only tell them stuff they want to hear. We'll put a bias on everything that they are very comfortable with. We'll fit our news to their biases. Well... What I don't like about that is that I think that as a business plan, it's probably a very smart and successful one. But what I don't believe it does is take a lot of people who are going to be Democrats 
and turn them into Republicans. I just don't believe that. What it does is convince all the people who are always going to vote against Obama that they are on some kind of holy crusade. I think... I don't, I, to answer your question directly, I'm not sure what you do about it, uh, except that if... Except that... If you think Fairfax is in trouble, mm. so is News Limited. They've just been cut off from their big global cross-subsidy and now they're pretty much on their own and they are discovering that the world is about as tough as we are. What we, are we are entering a period in which the MSM, as they say on Twitter, the mainstream media, uh, is become, will become increasingly less relevant to what people hear and think about. So maybe that's an answer. It's actually going to make life very difficult for journalists as we make the transition to the digital world. I might uh, just add to that. I uh, happened uh, to be at a function in February in New York and had a chat to Rupert Murdoch. And um, I said to him, now that Obama's won, uh, how's Fox and business going? Oh, making more money than ever, he said. I said, really, with Obama? He said, yeah. Almost half the nation hate him and they only watch us and uh, business is booming. Just to build on Ross's point. So, uh, look, I, I think America and Fox play uh, differently to how potentially Murdoch Press plays here. I think in America... The issue culturally is always the individual's freedoms over and against the government. It's why gun control is so impossible because government's seen to take away a freedom. Healthcare was actually that same thing. You know, my freedom over and against the government, Obama doing this in healthcare. And it's buried within American DNA, um, even their movies. Most uh, Movies have 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue as the source of a conspiracy and they blow up FBI buildings. And so I think there are cultural differences there. Uh, but certainly it is the case here that Murdoch uh, has let it be known what he's doing. And the Telegraph, I found interesting that front page, given that you might have just waited a week to hear some policies before you delivered a verdict. <laughs> that might have been nice. Uh, yeah, up, up the back up here. Hi, I was just wondering what you think of corporate greed and what your thoughts are on political donations. Corporate greed and political donations. Uh, well, I think there is a lot of corporate greed. I'm really, what I was trying to say earlier is that I think that corporate greed has been sanctified by uh, the increased influence of the opinions of economists. And we're living in a period where... There was a time when businesses could express the views that they, we see them expressing and the rest of Australia would say, well, you're entitled to your opinion. Uh, but of course, and, and in fact, because there wasn't a lot of receptiveness to businesses getting up and saying the most self-interested things, businesses didn't. I mean, I've been, in this, uh, I've been in the news business for 40 years and I've seen the way it changed. And when I started 40 years ago, it wasn't like it is today. Um, it, we have, I think, part of the emphasis on economics with its emphasis on self-interest. The model is driven by self-interest. It kind of sanctifies self-interest and it makes it uh, more respectable to stand up and just pursue something that's in the interest of you uh, and your uh, class and not worry about the rest. In a sense, uh, the political uh, arena has become a lot more competitive of a whole host of vested interests being a lot more overt in the things that they say. What do I think about political donations? I think it's the key to improving politics. Uh, what we need to is to have a, a situation where there are real limits on the extent to which businesses and probably also unions can make donations to political parties 
And we'd be much better off if we had rules that, that say everybody who, who has the privilege of have a bro having a broadcasting licence is required to run uh, a bunch of ads, uh, but they have to be quite long ads so that there's actually an argument and not just an emotive thing. We'll have it on the ABC, we'll have it on the commercials too as a, as a condition of their licence. And as part of that, we get rid of this huge uh, bidding war that goes on between the parties of, of desperately spending more in every election campaign and being very desperate to, ex to get donations from business and from uh, the unions uh, so because election campaigns get more expensive every year. I have to say that... I have to acknowledge that in advocating this, I'm speaking against the interests of the commercial media who have provided me with a very comfortable living for 40 years. <laughs> Tim, do you want to touch uh, oh, on that? Yeah, look, I, I totally agree with that on political donations, on, um, on corporate greed. This is a global problem now. So uh, the G20, for example, uh, is going to try and focus on how do you get private investment into markets when governments are broke. And the discovery that the tax base erosion is just happening everywhere with governments is why you've got David Cameron standing up and talking about the Googles not paying their tax in Britain. It's a little funny because most of the tax havens have the Queen's picture on the stamp. Uh, but there you go. Um, and the flight of capital, the attraction uh, of countries to try and get capital means that business uh, can write its own rules. And that's, that's a, a global governance issue now. Uh, there's a question down the front here. Could I thank both of you for a, a wonderful talk about uh, um, how to be more e equitable in Australia. Can I get you to stretch your mind to the whole issue of the refugees and where that fits in? Um, it seems that the two major political parties seem to be trying to outdo one another in being more and more... Um, dogmatic in the views that they are taking in terms of this very small percentage of people who are coming into Australia, 1% of people, who are by and large actually seen, assessed as being refugees. And the Australian people seem to be accepting this and this does not seem to be the kind of thing we would expect if we are equitable as Australians. It's quite different from what we had with the, uh, the Vietnamese refugees, even if we go back to the um, Italian and Greek people in the 1950s. Can you just um, tell me what you think about this in terms of us becoming more equitable as, uh, as Australians? Yeah, let me go first. Um, I've come back from Jordan and Lebanon, where a tenth of the population of Jordan are now Syrian refugees. A fifth of the population of Lebanon are Syrian refugees. The amazing thing is 70% of them are in Jordanian and Lebanese homes and host communities. And I asked myself, are Australians this heartless? I'd like to think if we saw the faces and heard the stories and we didn't have the distance and the anonymity, we would be equally generous. Uh, it's why I don't trust, you know, the government's reasons we don't lay our press into the camps and we're not going to really tell the stories because I think it's a way of distancing. Um, you know, look, from World Vision's point of view, back in the mid-70s, we bought a boat called Sea Sweep. We started picking up Indo-Chinese who were drowning. No countries in the region would take them. We embarrassed the Singapore's, Malaysia's, Hong Kong's into taking them. Malcolm Fraser and Gough Whitlam behind closed doors in a bipartisan way, and this is the difference. My real anger is both have played this uh, as a political card instead of settling it, as complex as it is in a bipartisan way. 
agreed to get more resettlement places that included Canada and America and Australia, and that's why we've got great in, um, Vietnamese restaurants in Australia and wonderful citizens. We dealt with it so differently. Um, once the Holy Grail was realised, when John Howard didn't allow the Tampa to land and jumped, what, 10 primary points, I think, he was behind Beasley, and people said, wow, there's electoral gold. Uh, both sides have played this. Um, and all I can say is um, our leaders have failed. Our leaders are weak. Leadership means saying, OK, there might be 70% of Australians who are blaming boat people for traffic congestion and cost of living rises and loss of jobs. We can educate them and get that down to 50%. That's what leadership does. You use incumbency. You put the argument. They haven't done it, which is why you're actually having to find leadership, not there now, but from the community where there is real, I think, genuine distress. Um, to, to just say very simply, most refugees just want to go home. There are some who can't because of well-founded fears of religious and political persecution. They're always a very small number. The problem is there's four times as many of them as resettlement places around the world. That's why you've got a people smuggling business. So regional solutions, us increasing resettlement places, saying to other countries, you increase them too, uh, is clearly the way to deal with this. And doing it not in a partisan political way, um, that's, that's what I think should happen. Look, I'm, I'm getting the wrap. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. I'm getting the wrap up. We've got one last uh, question here before I say just a few quick remarks to, uh, to end tonight. Thank you. My question's to Ross Gittins. Um, are there any effective, politically feasible uh, measures that could be introduced that would reduce inequality within a reasonable time frame? Uh, in particular, uh, is there any low-hanging fruit amongst the measures that could be uh, contemplated. And my supplementary question is to Tim Costello. Um, how do we get this issue onto the community's agenda and keep it there? Thank you. Well, I have to confess that I don't have a to-do list on this topic. If, you, if I, you gave you a little bit more time, I could come up with some more useful suggestions. But I think that we could do better than accept, as economists do, that a 5% rate of unemployment is full employment. Um, now, I understand why economists think that way. And uh, it is true that the people who constitute that 5%, for the most part, are not terribly employable people. Um, if, I was, if I was going to do something that I thought was the closest I could find to a magic bullet, but, and there are no magic bullets, but this would be a, a, something that would take a long time. It is to really put a lot more money into early childhood development. The prop, one of the problems with politicians is that um, they govern by collecting a majority and they, gov they collect a majority by squaring away a whole enough of the conflicting interest groups around. And so the politicians will never, if you come up with a magic answer, the politicians will never give you enough money to make it work because they'll be spreading that money around among all the other people who think they've got a magic answer. So they never actually spend enough money in any area, they just spread it thinly so that most of it doesn't do all that much good. But if you force me, I would, I would say that and I would shift that money at the expense of harder um, things to solve, which is the older people are and the more um, set they are in their ways, the more, the, the more the sort of less cost effective your actions can be. What Heckman has demonstrated is that if you get to children very, very early, and you focus on the ones that are at risk, and you have um, 
uh, nurses and people visiting people in the home and helping them cope with young children and so on, that that can just have a long-term payoff that transforms those children's lives but also has all these other benefits for the rest, for the rest of us. Do you want me to respond to that issue? Yeah. How do we get that on the agenda was the question. Um, well, uh, that's why World Vision exists, actually. We know all the damage is done in the first few years. We're a child-focused organisation from brain development to the stunting. We know that intervention, early intervention, is the critical uh, uh, cost factor for later development, productivity, name whatever flourishing means for you. So um, being child-focused, I think, is a, uh, a real question to ask of politicians in this election. How do you get it on the agenda? I'm not sure. Uh, and um, I, I think the evidence is so overwhelming that... Uh, and when you think about it, the great engine that drives human history is parents making the most unbelievable sacrifices just so their kids might have a better chance, a better life than them. This is actually the engine. And I don't understand why then we aren't prioritising those children, making that uh, the political priority uh, for them. Um, let me just uh, add to that briefly. I think we're here to talk about <clears throat> inequality. Um, Tim's already touched on something tonight. We could, uh, uh, we could regulate gambling. The purpose of gambling, you know, is, is to take money from those with the least and give it to those with the most. It's a very effective mechanism for doing that and, uh, and, and Tim and World Vision and others have, have, done, have done much to uh, address that. Um, we, could, uh, uh, we could look at the tax concessions that we give for capital gains, uh, two-thirds of which accrue to the wealthiest 10% of the population. It's around $7 billion a year. Uh, we could look at the tax concessions we give for superannuation, $10 billion a year of which accrues to the wealthiest 5% of the population. Um, you know, policy, uh, policy isn't an accident, and when our policy accidentally delivers the most to those with the most, and when our policy accidentally prevents us from helping those with the least, uh, I think we should look uh, far more closely at what's behind that. Um, uh, to wrap up, uh, let, me, uh, let me put uh, uh, the, the, the public debate about uh, equality, a debate that we're, we're, we're proud to see so many people here tonight willing to join. Let me put it into some perspective for you in terms of the question. That, where was the, who asked about corporate greed? Up there somewhere. Yeah. Um, next time, here's a little quiz for you. Here's a little homework. Next time you hear any captain of industry being interviewed on Fran Kelly or Lee Sales, or you name it, you listen carefully for the word they never mention. It's profit. They don't talk about it. What they talk about is creating jobs for poor people, creating jobs for Indigenous people, building prosperity so that Australia, all of us, can get rich together. They don't want low wages so their profits will rise. Oh, no. <laughs> they only want low wages so they can help us get rich. All of us, together. Good. Next time you hear them on radio, laugh when they don't mention profit. Why do you want industrial relations reform? Or to increase our profit. Why do you want cuts in the corporate tax rate? Oh, well, to increase the profit we can distribute to our shareholders. They never, ever mention it. Why? Because they know that Australians want an equal society. They know that we, collectively, don't like corporate greed. They know that we wouldn't introduce and support policies that would overtly deliver the most to those with the most. That's why they have to make up stories about how, as luck would have it, by making them rich, they can help everybody else. So if you listen carefully to what those uh, who, who, who advocate for corporate greed, as you put it, listen very carefully. They don't talk about greed. They talk about sharing. Why? Because their polling tells me what an audience like this tells me, that they know 
on average, the Australian public, uh, don't want a very unequal society. So um, uh, before I ask you to join me in, uh, in thanking our, our fantastic speakers tonight, uh, you know, if, uh, uh, if it wasn't for organisations, uh, if it wasn't for organisations like World Vision, then we wouldn't be having uh, the debate about uh, uh, corporate tax and corporate tax evasion, uh, where, where, where tens of billions of dollars uh, go missing, strangely enough, from, from the coffers of the poorest governments in the world and wind up in the pockets of their owners in other countries. If it wasn't for organisations like Fairfax that, uh, uh, that give us people like Ross Gittins who can explain these things to us, uh, then we wouldn't know as much about it. And I think supporting organisations like World Vision, supporting, uh, I'm sure Ross will be happy, supporting Fairfax and uh, perhaps not Fox News is, uh, uh, is a good way to, to ensure that we understand these things. Uh, maybe even enrol yourself at, uh, uh, at Melbourne University and find out uh, that tackling poverty wouldn't destroy the economy. I don't think they teach that here. Uh, <laughs> And uh, of course, uh, feel free to uh, uh, feel free to, as I said before, if if you didn't get the clipboard, feel free to sign up or uh, for uh, for some updates about our work in this area or the website, the Australian Institute website or Facebook page. We're funded philanthropically, and and all of our research is is freely available. Hard to get more equitable than that. So uh, so thank you for for coming tonight. Uh, thank you for helping us. Uh, to honour uh, Gavin Mooney and, and his wife Dell, and but most important at the moment, can you please join me in thanking Tim Costello and Ross Gittins? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You should be a stand-up comic. <laughs>